All right, let's go to our Sunday School lesson. Turn to Matthew chapter 2 again. Matthew chapter 2. We're at verse 14. The wise men have come and they worship the young Messiah. And they've been warned by God not to return to Herod and tell him uh, uh, the whereabouts of the babe. And now they've gone back home to their own country. Verse 13 says, When they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. God reveals his will in a dream. This was common in the Old Testament. Quote, God came to Abimelech in a dream by night. Genesis 20, verse 3 states. We read that Jacob, quote, dreamed and behold a ladder set up on the earth and the top reached to heaven. Genesis 28, verse 12. And the subject of the angel of the Lord comes up again. How could the angel of the Lord, if it was Christ in foreshadow, uh, be an appearance of God at the same time he was God manifest in the flesh as a young child? It seems like a difficulty, but it, it really shouldn't be. Most commentaries and modern Bible versions will suggest that an angel simply means a messenger uh, of God. But that is the incorrect definition from the uh, vocabulary of the Koine Greek uh, from which our Bible comes. Uh, not only was an angel uh, a messenger of God, but it was an appearance of God to carry out some purpose. Um, an appearance of the Lord is not the Lord himself. You recall, um, God appeared to Moses in a burning bush, Genesis, or, uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. But the bush wasn't God, uh, obviously. Herod is looking for a chance to kill the young Christ and eliminate any competition to the throne or any uh, authority and rule over the nation which he might have enjoyed uh, with the oversight of the Roman government. God warns Joseph to take the young child and his mother and escape to Egypt until it's safe to return. Look at verses 14 and 15. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. Now that quotation is from Hosea 11, verse 1. Turn there if you want, just for a moment. Hosea 11 and verse 1. It says there, When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. That is what Matthew is referring to. The historical reference was to Israel as a nation leaving Egypt under the leadership of Moses. Hosea was referring to a past event, but doctrinally, it also referred to a future event, the protection of Christ in his infancy when the time came. And inspirationally, it reveals God's love, not only for his own son, but also for the nation of Israel. If God was not standing by the survival of the Jewish people, they would have been destroyed long ago. And there have been great uh, attempts and efforts by whole governments to destroy the existence of the Jewish people. But all scripture can have more than one application. Recall the name Israel also meant a prince with God, which Christ certainly is. Um, Isaiah 9, verse 6 
says his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And uh, notice verse 16 now. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. This was one of the cruelest acts in all of history, the murder of toddlers, young children, out of fear and blind uh, rage and ambition. And it's going to find, it, it finds its parallels, if you want, in Fox's Book of Martyrs and the atrocities uh, of the Catholic Church uh, visited upon people who would not recognize the Pope's authority or bow down to a wafer god. When the Catholic Church says they have Christ in them, they mean they ate Jesus in the form of a wafer at the Mass. And the priest holds that wafer up, and after he's said his magic words of hocus pocus, um, then he holds that up and says, this, my, my brothers and sisters, this is Jesus. This is the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. And uh, they break it, and he has a whole, he has one big one that he breaks into pieces and which he partakes of. And then there's a bowl of some smaller ones, uh, mass produced, for the congregation to come up the aisle and receive one. And any extra ones, any leftovers, are put into a holding a container called the tabernacle, usually made of some bronze or uh, even gold-plated uh, precious material, and then under lock and key, so they know where Jesus is at all times. And when they walk, and when they walk past that, they kneel down uh, to recognize that the actual body of Jesus is in there, under the form of wafers, or as Jack Chick used to refer to, cookies. Um, I had a friend in the funeral business. He and I, of course, he was a he was a uh, an Assembly of God preacher. He and I were working a Catholic funeral together. Of course, neither one of us believed in the trans transformation or transubstantiation of the elements, the wafer and the wine. And But we're in the church, and we're sitting in the very back row while the funeral is going on. And when the priest was getting ready to uh, call people forward to pass out the wafers, he, he motions to me across the aisle and says, I'm going to go get two because I missed breakfast. So, man, <laughs> you are very disrespectful, Chuck. <laughs> I wonder if someone ever took one and dunked it into the wine, you know. Oreos. <laughs> okay, but I digress. Um, but it finds its, its parallel in the atrocities visited by Catholics upon Protestants. Think of the famous St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in France in about 1572. Uh, Catholic authorities uh, gave a signal around midnight and the houses of French Huguenots who were Protestants were burst open and uh, French troops loyal to the Catholic Church just went through and just began murdering right and left. And after about 72 hours, they say some like between five and 15,000 people had been murdered. And it was such a success that the Pope had a commemorative coin uh, struck uh, with the, his face on one side and a depiction of the slaughter of Huguenots, a, a soldier running a spear through a Protestant on the backside. We used to have a picture of that coin, and it's, it's very valuable if some coin collector has one, but we used to have a picture of that on our church website. We should probably retrieve that and put it more prominently on the website in the future. And uh, so don't let ever, anyone ever tell you, well, that wasn't the Catholic Church. Those were, and why did the Pope strike a commemorative coin in honor of it if they had nothing to do with it? But um, you can imagine the screaming mothers trying to protect their children as Herod's troops ripping them out of their arms. And if they weren't able to wrest their control of the 
children away from the parents, they may have uh, result, uh, they may have turned to murdering both the father and mother as well as the child. They left a lot of bloody bodies behind. Like I say, one of the most vicious acts in human history. Um, this verse also gives us a better, he was a political opportunist, controlled by Satan, Herod was. But this text also gives us a better uh, glimpse as to the time or the, the age of the young child uh, allowing some uh, leeway for the travel time of the wise men going and not coming back, and so and Herod recognizing that uh, they weren't returning, he orders the slaughter of all the children in around Bethlehem because that's the last place he knew that they were headed. Of course, they didn't go to Bethlehem. Once they started, once they left Herod, the star appeared to them and they led them to where Christ was at the time. He didn't spend more than one night in the manger in, in Bethlehem. Yet yeah, that stands to reason. You, why would you stay in a barn if you didn't have to, you know, more than one night if you weren't forced to? But so he orders the slaying of all the children in around the coast of Bethlehem, two years old and under, which would suggest that uh, by the time they came and did that, Christ he guessed would probably be between one year old and 18 months old. Just to make sure he got them, he said, kill all the babies two, under two years old. Verses 17 and 18. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. It was not a verbatim translation, but it's a, it's a paraphrase, almost, ex, almost exact, because you go from Hebrew into English in the Old Testament. Here you've got um, Matthew's Greek writing of it, so, and, and now then being, being translated into English also in our Bible. But as a Bible believer, I believe God is able to superintend the words however he wants to and keep them in the form he wants them to be for whatever language it needs to be in. And since we believe the King James Bible is the perfect word of God in English, and we don't have to go back to Hebrew and Greek and dusty manuscripts and reinvent the wheel uh, every five or six years like all these publishing houses do, we believe the wheel was perfected in 1611. Now we're simply fitting it to, to different cars. And I think that's largely what uh, Song Lee did with the Korean King James Bible. He, although he tried to make it line up with Greek and Hebrew as best as he could following the King James pattern. But ultimately, what ended up happening was translating it from English right into Korean. You don't have to go back and dust off Greek and Hebrew manuscripts. Just take it from English right into Korean, or English right into Spanish, which the Spanish version, the Reina Valera, has been around for decades, and it's been added to and tweaked by different publishers here and there. But uh, the most updated one, which I think is probably as accurate as it can be in Spanish, and that is the Reina Valera Gomez version, which is the most recent um, update uh, by a real Bible believer who believes in the King James Bible and uh, wants to put the same thing in Spanish. So the Reina Valera Gomez version, which Chick Publications publishes and has been promoting, we'll have to wait and let God make it uh, prosper if that's what he wants to do. However, King James English right into whatever language it needs to go into. Don't worry about Hebrew and Greek. That was all taken care of and settled in 1611. <clears throat> and the prophecy of Rachel weeping for her children. Jacob was the father of the nation. He was the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so Rachel was spoken of in type as the mother of the nation. Just kind of like Martha Washington, the mother of our country. Uh, the prophecy was taken from Jeremiah 31 and verse 15. Jump down to verses 19 and 20. 
But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead, which sought the young child's life. Again, the young child is mentioned before his mother, just as in verses 11, 13, 14, and also verse 21. The Holy Spirit knew who was more important to the story, uh, the young child or the mother. You read these so-called prayers, and they're not prayers, they're simply uh, texts written by Roman Catholic uh, writers, a prayer to St. Francis, prayer to the Virgin Mary, prayer to Our Lady of Guadalupe, prayer to this saint, this figure, and uh, so often the, the text, it'll read, we implore the help of to through the Virgin Mary, we implore thy the your kind graces, uh, your pardon, and then the very end they'll say, along with thy son. Jesus always gets um, second mentioned in a Catholic prayer, in a Catholic prayer book. So many Catholic prayers to the Virgin Mary and her son, the Virgin Mary and the Savior. He's always in second place in a Catholic missal, a Catholic prayer book. If you ever read any of their works, pay attention to that and see how it contrasts with the order the Holy Spirit put uh, Christ and Mary in the scriptures. The expression land of Israel here uh, is synonymous with the whole of the nation, not just the ten northern tribes, the kingdom of Israel. Verses 21 and 22, And he arose and took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea, in the room of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. Galilee was a territory in the northern half of the country, and it borders the, bordered the Sea of Galilee, thus the name, it was called the Sea of the Plain back in 2 Kings 14, verse 25, as the kingdom of Israel was establishing its borders or settling its borders. Um, also called, it was also referred to as Galilee of the Nations in Isaiah 9, verse 1. It had a mixed population. So in this, so it wasn't just Jews, it was other Gentile, non-Jewish nations dwelling in that territory as well. So in this sense, Joseph did go to the land of Israel, or the kingdom of Israel, what, what was left of it. Um, uh, Archelaus was the son of Herod's fourth wife, according to history books. Um, and Joseph could have no assurance that Archelaus would be any better than his father Herod. It was probably like father, like son. Herod wouldn't have died without giving clear instructions to his son or his successors to be on the lookout for any young Jewish man claiming to be a king one day. And Archelaus would have been watching like a hawk for anyone to uh, be a threat to his authority, to his rule, his family's throne. And according to history books, he was reared in Rome and later banished by the empire to Vienna, Austria, in 6 AD, where he eventually died. We think of the, the distance uh, between nations from Jerusalem to what we call Vienna, Austria now, but the Roman Empire was vast for that time in world history. Verse 23, And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Nazareth was to the southern end of Galilee, of the Galilean territory, I should say. And it was um, what they would call a, a variegated, diverse population. Not just, a, not just an exclusively Jewish population as a Jerusalem uh, was, was at the time. 
Um, it's one of Israel's most populous cities today, the city of Nazareth. And uh, it was because of its mixed population that Nathaniel could later ask, can, any, can there anything, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? John 1, verse 46. But that mixed population is a hint to the fact that Christ's mission would not be limited to the Jews only. In fact, go back to the book of Isaiah chapter 9 with me for just a minute. Isaiah 9. And notice verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Uh, not, the, not the duration, not the length of time of his government, but the size and the scope, the increase of his government. So Christ's reign and his rule one day is not going to be restricted or limited only to the city of Jerusalem or even just to the nation of Israel, but is going to expand and grow and spread out throughout the entire universe. Do you know that if Adam and Eve had not sinned in the garden and had not eaten the forbidden fruit that God had commanded them not to eat, then in, well, I'm going to just for today, I'm just going to say in theory, but in fact, they would still be alive today. Reproducing, replenishing the earth, populating, and being fruitful and multiplying. Had they not sinned, nothing would have interrupted that command to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Well, don't you know, uh, for the last 6,000 years, if they had been doing that, and all of their descendants had been doing that, and all of their descendants had been doing that, this earth would be pretty crowded about now. Which can only mean that the kingdom of Jesus Christ is going to expand beyond planet earth. It's going to expand out to the farthest galaxies and the entire universe. Because it's all made, it was all made by him, and all made for him one day. So there's no reason to doubt that probability. And uh, if Christ was able to traverse from earth to space in a glorified body without need of some oxygen breathing apparatus or anti-gravity uh, mechanisms or suit or, or ship, then uh, so, should you, so will you and I be when your body is glorified like his one day. And so the entire universe is going to be yours for the possession and the control and the exploration as God allows of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. So his kingdom is not going to be limited only to the nation of Israel here on the earth. It will be uh, throughout the entire known universe. But that mixed population is a hint to the fact that Christ's mission would not be only to the Jews. The Bible says he came unto his own, the Jews, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, Jew and Gentile, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. John 1, verses 11 and 12. That includes me and you. I'm not Jewish, and, uh, but I got in on salvation by the blood of Christ. Um, salvation through his blood is offered to both Jews and Gentiles. Thank the Lord for that. It says in this text, verse 23, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. Now this has caused some people trouble because there is no verse in the Old Testament that says he shall be called a Nazarene. 
there is the city of Nazareth, and someone from that city is referred to as a Nazarite, and the vows of a Nazarite separated unto God uh, to abstain from wine or anything made from the vine tree, anything from grape juice or any fermented wine uh, were very clear. And nowhere in Christ's public ministry do we read of him actually drinking wine himself. He turned water into wine, John chapter 2 in Cana, when they offered him wine mixed with myrrh on the cross to sort of stupefy and numb the pain, he refused. And so it may be said that in that sense, he was uh, fulfilling the rules for a Nazarite's vow in Numbers chapter 6 during his ministry. But even that's largely conjecture, theoretical by some good preachers. But it says, spoken not written, by the prophets, plural. So that's not a fixed quotation from any single book of any prophet. It is, It was undoubtedly spoken by the prophets in ages past, so much so that, the, that Matthew knew about it and they were familiar with it when he wrote. But you can't pinpoint one actual verse in the Old Testament. This is what he's quoting. Go forward, if you will, to the book of, uh, rather here in Matthew. Go to chapter... 27. Matthew 27 and uh, verses 8 and 9. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy or Jeremiah the prophet, saying, and they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, so forth and so on. It says, spoken by Jeremy or Jeremiah the prophet. That quotation is not found anywhere in the book of Jeremiah. A guy tried to call this to my attention years ago and say, you see, there is a mistake in the King James Bible because he's referring to a quote, and that quote is actually found in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah 11, verse 12. And he said, you see, there's a there's obvious mistake in the book of Matthew, in the Bible. Of course, he tried to tear me away from my belief in the King James Bible. And it's funny, though, over, the, over time, I've looked at how other translations handle this text, and they all say Jeremiah the prophet. So he can't really accuse my Bible of being guilty of something his isn't. And then, I, and then it occurred to me, the text doesn't say that which was written by Jeremiah the prophet. It says that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet. Jeremiah and Zechariah were contemporaries with each other, the Old Testament. And so it's entirely possible that what Zechariah had written, Jeremiah merely repeated. So much so that, that Matthew could give Jeremiah credit for having said it in his day, although it wasn't recorded by Jeremiah. So this is what Dr. Ruckman would mean very often when he would say there's no proven error in the King James Bible. See, that's always the best way to handle it, saying, um, I believe the King James Bible is the word of God without any proven error. And I think he was right in that approach. But um, so the best course of action is to always. So sometimes, as a couple of quotes earlier, it said that was that which was spoken in the prophet by the prophet earlier. Uh, sometimes it is a reference to a quotation to a book. But here, he's you have to pay close attention to the verse. It says that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, not written. It was written by Zechariah, but not spoken by Zechariah. In this case, it was spoken by Jeremiah, Jeremiah the prophet, not written by Jeremiah the prophet. <laughs> so both things can be true, and uh, there's no established contradiction, therefore no proven error in the King James Bible. To be a Bible believer means to believe every single word on the page is there by the will and the providence of God. For the last 1,900 years, on nearly 2,000 years, 
those scriptures have been safeguarded and protected and to, to the point where we have a copy in our own hands. A lot of bloodshed has taken place uh, by Christians to safeguard it and protect it and keep it for future generations so that you and I can come to it with absolute 100% confidence that not a single thing there is by a mistake of God. Sometimes you might see a misspelling and you clearly that's a mistake of the publisher, that whoever published it. And I've got a whole bunch in my Bible when I come across one. It was funny. I mean, that's another side. We'll get to that. But so sometimes you'll find a mistake in the spelling. That's the fault of the, the publisher. But that's not the fault of the, but find an accurate rendition of the King James text and uh, believe everything is there by the direction of God. And uh, I'll go so far as to say, I even accept the punctuation to be directed by God. When you see an italicized word, a word in italics, that was added by the translators to smooth out the sense of the sentence in, in question. But I even accept the italics as being the word God wants to be there. Read 1 Corinthians 14, and every time you see the phrase um, speaking with other tongues, um, the word, it's, it's in uh, italics. Actually, let me turn, let me have you run over there. We'll, suddenly I've got a mind slip. I'll run over there and... Okay. Yeah, verse... First Corinthians 14, verse 13. Wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. The word unknown is italicized every time, 1 Corinthians 14. The translators added it there to make sense of the text for the reader. And the idea was if someone comes into your church and they're speaking a language that nobody's familiar with, to them it's unknown because they don't know it. It doesn't mean it's some incoherent gibberish out in the ether somewhere that you know only somebody controlled by a, a special spirit can utter and, and recall or and understand. It simply means the person hearing it doesn't know it. And so it's called an unknown tongue. It doesn't mean it's, you know, some gibberish somewhere. It's an actual language, but the, the people that are hearing it aren't familiar with it. Korean was an entirely unknown tongue to me when I first met some of you. It's uh, largely unknown, but I understand a few. I understand when you're talking about me. Because, you know, they'll say something, 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 tribe mooks, da 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 so even if they don't, even if they don't finish it in English, I know you're talking about me. So believe that what you're reading, every word there is by the direction of God. And now all your job is to do is to trust the Holy Spirit to teach you the Bible as you read it without changing a word in. Remember, I've said this before. My job is not to change the Bible. The Bible's job is to change me. Every Christian should approach the word of God that way.